Hey everyone, and welcome. I'm Peter Askim. I'm the artistic director of the Next Festival of Emerging Artists. And we're so excited to have you here and really excited to have Jason here. Um, Jason Haheim did an amazing workshop with us last week. And we're so happy that he's back to kind of dive deeper into the ideas of deliberate practice. So I just wanted to let you all know that we're really close to announcing our 2021 Next Festival of Emerging Artists season. Um, so we have two more weeks of Next Fest Connects, these workshops online, which are free and open to you. Uh, and then we will be in June having a four week festival on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons and evenings, which most of that will be open and available to you as well. Um, so we hope that you will join us. Keep an eye out. We'll be sending out a season announcement really soon, but just incredible artists um, and lined up. And what we do is try and help all of you artists, um, developing artists, younger students, um, all of us who have been trying to make our way in the arts during these times. So I'm just putting right now in the chat um, a link to our website and to Jason's website. And he's also doing a deliberate practice boot camp that's starting up soon. That link is there. Um, he shared his slides from last time. I would think that he might share his slides this time. I'll follow up with Absolutely. all of you uh, after afterwards. So. Um, yeah, just want to say thank you for being here. Um, we've been doing free workshops for all of you since March of 2020. Uh, our priority is to make as much information and community and inspiration free and available to all of you, but also to pay our artists. So we would be really happy if you're interested in making a tax deductible donation to the festival through that, that link that I posted in the chat. And so without further ado, I want to hand it off to Jason. Jason, it's great to see you and I'm really can't wait for what you have to say this week. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, great to be back. Um, it's good to see everybody. I recognize a lot of familiar names and profile pictures here. So um, as you probably remember last week, we were talking about the sort of part one of two of, of my um, ideas about deliberate practice and how it how it fits into sort of our, our moment right now. Um, so for the second session, as I kind of promised last time, I'm going to now be uh, digging way deeper into this framework of deliberate practice, kind of what that methodology is about, and specifically how I believe it can confer diverse skills for these unusual, unprecedented, unstable times that we're living in. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. If you didn't catch the first session, uh, again, I recognize a lot of you, but in case you are uh, new to the, the sessions here, um, no problem, gonna give a quick refresher. Deliberate practice I defined as the scientific method applied to your craft, that it is a slow, rigorous, incremental, basically endless process of experimentation to cultivate specific skills in any discipline. In our case, we're talking about music, but this is really generalizable. It's not mindless repetition, it's focused, attentive, specifically targeting weaknesses and using feedback loops to improve performance. One of the things I'm going to do at the end of this session is start to show you guys examples of how I applied some of this stuff in my own practice. So you'll be able to see some of the like focused and attentive stuff, some of the targeting of weaknesses, how I incorporated feedback loops. It, it should make that more clear by the end. Um, and as I kind of emphasized last time, it's this efficient process of skill development accessible to all of us that also critically does not depend on innate talent. So you might remember last week we were talking about, um, you know, I think it's really helpful to reorient the way you think about talent, that it's that it's earned rather than gifted. This is not something that's an innate genetic quality. Um, I also talked about how, you know, we need to consider the long game here and, and that it's philosophically really helpful to not focus as much on one-off accomplishments or discrete outcomes that are not really under your control, but rather your process of practicing. Um, you know, recognizing that this, you know, wherever you are in your career or what kind of career path you're on, that however you define success, like this takes a long time, like, like usually many years after schooling. Um, a lot of this comes from the idea that like, yes, a lot of music students are told what to practice, but until recently, there's been a lot less emphasis on how to practice. And that's kind of where the deliberate practice methodology comes in. Uh, we talked about a couple questions last time, such as, 
you know, maybe not as, as helpful to ask yourself, am I good enough right now? We all, we all want that validation, but rather, am I willing to do the work? And that even if you feel like you got some sort of late start in this, or if you're working with students that feel that way, one of my other big points here is that, you know, this is all about trajectory and the trajectory is all about the quality of your practicing. And that's something any of us can take on and improve pretty much at any time. Um, you might recall too, last time I, I put up this slide, this is from Anders Ericsson's book, Peak, where he says, with deliberate practice, the goal is not just to reach your potential, but to build it, to make things possible that were not possible before. And thinking about this idea of, of building that potential and increasing your trajectory of improvement, I want to go back to one of the slides I showed last time also, where this was my, my sort of graphical biography. But in between these different inflection points, I want to highlight these different trajectory regimes numerically. Because what was really going on here is that after this point, around 2008, this was after I read Talent is Overrated and after I started to really implement a lot of these ideas of deliberate practice for myself, I, I began to realize like, oh, this is what really high quality practicing can be. And so I was estimating the number of hours I was putting in each day, each week, each month, and then adding them up to get this, this kind of numerical graphical estimate of, of what was going on with my trajectory. What I then did is basically back calculate to realize like, oh, a lot of these earlier hours, it's not that they didn't count for nothing, but they just weren't as effective. I couldn't weight them the same way. And, you know, I think that's important to realize because again, I mentioned this last time, but in, in these earlier phases, while I was still ramping up and kind of getting turned on to orchestral performance, but, but not really seriously applying myself yet, you know, none of my teachers in there in any of these areas were telling me like, hey, you're a, you're a prodigy that's going to end up at the Met someday. Absolutely not. You know, any of my teachers you talked to between 1988 and, and the late 2000s would simply not have predicted this outcome for me, right? And, and why would they have, right? I, I really wasn't that serious about this yet. And even with that, you know, I, I really have to acknowledge that there is so much randomness in our field, right? I, I, I have an analogy for this, which is sort of like um, playing poker at a, at a table that requires a really high minimum bet, which is to say that like, you have to do a ton of work, this, this, you know, all of these accumulated hours, just to get to the place where you've, you've got the, you know, demonstrated skills in orchestra settings to be in a semifinal or final round, right? And, and there's just no shortcut there. There's no way around that. That's the minimum bet. But then at that, at that point, like there's just randomness, right? And, and you get dealt certain hands and you do what you can with it. And you hope that, you know, your playing aligns with the aesthetic expectations and preferences of that committee on that day or that music director, but you, you don't know, right? And, you know, in my case, it's always humbling to consider that it just could have all gone so very, very differently, right? I was taking a lot of auditions in here. Some of them didn't work out. This one did. It could have been different. Um, you know, my, the, the vote in my final round at the Met was seven to six. I mean, it's just as close as it gets. And so I, I'm also then extremely fortunate. I mean, even, even considering the current modern condition of the Met Opera, which I addressed last time, um, I'm still really fortunate that things turned out the way they did. And the point of this is really that, you know, it took me a long time to get to this zone four where I was practicing really efficiently and improving really quickly. Um, but it took me a long time because I lacked the understanding of what a good practice process is and I lacked the tools to implement it. And that's what I want to give you a taste of now this evening and hopefully save you some time. So, what I've tried to do then is put the framework all on one page. Um, in, in my week-long deliberate practice boot camp, we basically spend the week dissecting this. And what I've tried to do is arrange it in these three areas, almost like a cooking recipe, so that you've got the steps required, you've got the ingredients, and then you've got the skills. 
And so, you know, if you're thinking with this cooking analogy or baking, it might be like, you know, preheat the oven to 350. The ingredients you need are, um, you know, uh, flour, salt, yeast, water. And the skill is like knowing how to knead bread dough or something. And the idea with this methodology, the attributes of deliberate practice is the integration is really key in all of this. And, you know, just like cooking, like you can leave out some ingredients, like it's, it's not going to be inedible if you leave out the yeast, it's just not going to be the kind of bread you were expecting. And I think that all really holds true in this case too. And so for the next few minutes, um, again, realizing we don't have time to go into full, full detail on this. Um, again, I mentioned last week, Anders Ericsson wrote a book over 400 pages about all of this. So there's, there's a lot to get into, but um, I think it's really worth it to step through what each of these things means. And I'm going to try to give it some context for what it meant in my own practicing life. So starting off at the very top, one of the core ideas of deliberate practice is that when you get into the practice room, like your practice sessions need to be intentionally designed. There needs to be thought given to what you're going to be doing and how you're going to be doing it and why. And it's not the thing that I did for so many years, which is like, you show up in the practice room and if you're me, you like grab some drumsticks, you're like, all right, cool, I, what are we doing today? Right, it, that's already, that's not really deliberate. Um, this, one of the, the caveats here is that, you know, the deliberate practice research says that it has to happen within a highly developed field. And you can think of that as basically meaning it's a field that has great teachers to learn from. Um, and so, you know, music is obviously one of these, we can, we can all seek out mentors and teachers. These teachers are often going to be helping you in the best instances, helping you to design and craft your practice process better. Also, you know, teachers see us in ways that we can't see ourselves. And ideally they're helping us solve problems that we don't know how to solve ourselves. Um, you know, I, I myself now as a teacher will sometimes get bored and frustrated when I'm working with a student and I'm just doing a lot of like easy diagnosis. Like, yeah, that's, that's rushing, that's dragging, that's sharp, that's flat. That's the kind of thing that I, I really believe now students can work on on their own, do a lot of that troubleshooting diagnosis on their own time. I prefer when students bring me problems such as you know, I have this tendency or I'm tending to rush here or I'm always playing this sharp or flat. Let's get to the next level and talk about like, how do I work on that? Like, how, how do I solve that problem? You, you, as the teacher, have solved this problem. What did you do? How did you approach this in your practice? Inevitably, that means taking yourself out of your comfort zone. When I, you know, walk through hallways of schools of music or, you know, hearing my students, I actually get suspicious if I'm hearing too much playing that's just good, right? Like if I'm hearing complete run throughs and things, it's oh, that sounds nice. Um, you know, if, if there's like a recital or an audition or something coming up really soon and they're, they're doing big runs. Yeah, that, that I get, but the bulk of the time, um, as, as you'll see, I, I have a, a demo video of this later. Um, you know, if you're in this zone where you're, you're moving beyond comfort and now you're, you're stretching yourself, you're often going to be doing things that don't sound that good. You might be practicing a single shift 20 times in a row. You'll be like doing a lot of repetition and, and drilling into very fine details where somebody sitting outside the practice room is like, oh yeah, that's not necessarily that pleasant to listen to. And that's kind of the way it should be. In doing that, you'll be working with some very well-defined and specific goals. And it, it can't be, you know, just play it better or play it faster, right? It has to be like, I have this very specific problem with my left hand and the way it's lifting from the drum on this one note. And so I'm going to practice 20 times in a row, this, this kinesthetic routine with a mirror and maybe some videotape, video camera, so that I can watch and make sure and ingrain that this is happening correctly and give me the kind of sound I want. That's not going to be pleasant to listen to, but that is a very specific goal. And like I said, this is going to involve massive repetition. Um, we could go on a, a fairly fascinating side discussion about this protein called myelin and the, the biological process of myelination. 
But suffice it to say, it's essentially the protein involved in deliberate practice, which is to say that when we are practicing, um, we are creating new th th think of your brain like like wires, like circuitry. If you're creating new wires, wires need to be insulated. Otherwise, the signals don't transmit fast and they don't transmit accurately. And this myelin protein is quite literally the insulation on our brain wires. And the accumulation of this takes time, but the accumulation of that also requires repetition. And it's the thing behind you know, this adage that we've all probably heard, which is that an amateur practices until they get it right, but a pro practices until they can't get it wrong. So there's this neurological basis to that, that idea. Okay, so moving to the next big step now, feedback. Feedback is really one of the most critical aspects of deliberate practice. And the thing I most frequently see is missing when uh, you know people come to me for coaching on this and when we try to get in there and kind of like figure out what they're doing and, and why certain things might not be working. Um, there's a, a famous saying that practicing without feedback is like bowling through a curtain where you won't get any better and you'll stop caring. And yet it's amazing because so many people practice hundreds of hours with virtually no feedback whatsoever. They're, they're basically relying on their teacher for all of the feedback. And truly one of the most transformative things for me in my practice process was when I started using my own ability to give myself feedback through self-recording and recording myself, I mean, literally every day. And so I'll talk a little bit later about how I do that, but that, that to me is just an indispensable cornerstone of deliberate practice. Um, that of course, you know, is going to be augmented by teachers. The teachers give you really necessary feedback. So can playing for other people, colleagues, mock audition committees. That's all critical. It's also important to remember that the well-defined specific goal part of it, like how do you know if you're hitting your goals? Well, feedback, like recording, gathering that evidence for yourself. And finally, the idea of repetition, yes, it is required, but sheer repetition on its own is not enough. Like the repetition has to be smart and driven by feedback because without feedback, the repetition is essentially the same as hurling that bowling ball down the lane over and over and over again and having no idea what's happening to the pins on the other side. Now, as you'll see later, when, when I start to put this all together in this kind of practicing demonstration video, um, there's a lot then that goes into one of these deliberate practice sessions. It is mentally demanding. Right, you're, you're first of all doing a lot of stuff with great repetition, which as human beings, we are just naturally not that prone to do, right? We get bored, we like external stimulation, we prefer to move on. Um, it it kind of goes against our nature. And part of the other reason of that is because it requires a lot of focus and concentration. And I am generally a very big fan, as you'll see, of incorporating technology and efficiency tools where I can and where appropriate to amplify the impact of my practicing. But this can have some definite drawbacks. Specifically, smartphones are distraction machines, right? And they will constantly sap our practice of efficacy. And so, you know, one of the rules I have for myself and for my students is that like when you're in, 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 in the practice room, your phone had better be in airplane mode. If it's not, and if you're doing these constant updates and dings and distractions, and like there's just no way to concentrate. Um, in fact, there's some recent research that's, that's sort of concerning in terms of how bad smartphones are for our focus and concentration and just for our brains. And the study was essentially three sets of people doing math problems. The first set had their phone out as usual on getting updates. The second set had their phone in airplane mode but it was still sitting on their desk. The third group had the phone entirely outside the room. And this is fascinating to me because as you'd expect, the first group did the math problems slowly and they got more wrong answers. The second group with you know airplane mode, more right answers did it faster because they were able to focus better. 
but the best group was the third group. So, so it's actually true that these things, even in our physical presence, exert this kind of psychic tug on our focus and concentration that is not good and, and it can compromise our work. And that led me to my, my kind of latest revision of my deliberate practice process is I just have an old iPhone that's a, a brick. <laughs> Basically, it, it's not even connected to the outside world. I loaded my tuner and my, uh, my metronome app on there. And that's what I bring into the practice. So as you can kind of imagine then, as we're, as we're moving through some of these steps, it's, it's requiring a lot of concentration. Oh, I, sh I should also go back and say a point about sufficient rest and, and sleep. Um, you know, I think it, it's intuitive that like being well rested enhances your focus and concentration. What's less clear, or at least was less clear for decades, was what is exactly happening when we sleep? And there's been, again, some pretty compelling new research that demonstrates that when we're sleeping, there are these channels within the tissue of our brains that open up and allow this kind of uh, watery cerebrospinal fluid to wash through there and clear out this accumulated protein called beta amyloid. So this is another one of these proteins involved in this. Myelin was the first one. The other one, beta amyloid, is concerning because this is the, the sort of marker protein of Alzheimer's disease. When, when advanced stage Alzheimer's patients are, are scanned, what is shown is a big accumulation of this protein. And this led some of these neurologists to conclude that, oh, like, wow, so sleep actually has this function of clearing out the extra brain garbage, these, these chemicals, beta amyloid, this protein that will accumulate if we don't sleep enough. And so chronic sleep deprivation, when we're kind of going around, we can't think straight, can't remember where we put the keys, that's a real thing that's happening. So moving on then, right, it, it's, it, it starts to kind of go without saying that this is a more intense, demanding kind of practice. Um, and, you know, one of the things that Erickson says in his research is that it's not, it's not inherently enjoyable, like it's not fun. Now, I hasten to add that that, that doesn't mean that it can't be ultimately rewarding or, or gratifying. I tend to think of this more like, um, you know, going for a run or like hiking at altitude where like often in the moment, like it, it hurts. <laughs> your, your lungs are like, oh, I need more air. Your, your legs are burning and your, your feet might hurt. Um, but at the end of it, you know, you're really glad you did it and you keep doing it and, and this becomes kind of a habit. But when you think about what I'm starting to lay out here, you know, you're using feedback, video recording, audio recording, to intensely scrutinize yourself and focus on things that you are specifically not good at, right? You're practicing the things you're not good at. Not this, you're not sitting there cruising through stuff that you already know how to play that's easy. You're focusing on your weaknesses. This requires letting go of some ego and, and you know, being comfortable with holding up this mirror of, of reality. Um, you're repeating things a lot and you're doing this for long periods of time until you know, you're, you're often very exhausted at the end of three or four hours of, of deliberate practice sessions. So this naturally leads to the idea that this requires a lot of willpower and there's commitment that goes into this. And that's why one of the other questions we discussed last session was getting to this idea of intrinsic motivation right? Um, you know, kind of being in this for reasons that are, that are good and sustainable rather than just like, oh, well, you know, my, my parents expect me to play the violin or the piano or something like that. Um, for me, that was asking these questions about, you know, it, not just am I good enough, but am I willing to do the work and imagining what success might look like 10 years down the road, but then also being comfortable with the idea that like, if that doesn't work out exactly the way I'm hoping, like, will it have been worth it? Am I Am I dedicated to a process and a craft that is gratifying? That, you know, stokes intrinsic motivation. Um, willpower is one of these ideas that, again, for decades was misunderstood as this like innate genetic thing, which is just wrong. Like the, the newer research really suggests that it's much more like a muscle, right? And that the more you exercise it, the stronger it gets, especially when it's fed by this idea of you know your focus being continuous refinement rather than just trying to get the next trophy, the next thing, the next outcome. So 
a couple of the final skills and understandings then that go into this overall cooking recipe is that as you do this, and, and I think we all recognize this, the, the, the further we get in a musical craft specifically, our perception becomes more enhanced. You know, and, and I'm, I'm certain you all perceive more in music than you did 10 years ago. I, I definitely do. And I think there's a useful visual analogy to be made for this kind of progression. When I think back about the way I was practicing and, and working in music, um, you know, back, back in high school, when I first started to think like, oh, okay, maybe I'm going to be a music major in college. My view, my, my sort of oral view of music was, was like this. It was black and white. And with more practice and more study and more knowledge and more abstract understanding of musical ideas, I started to move into a, a regime where it was not black and white so much, but now there was a little more detail and, and, and grayscale. Um, I would say maybe by the time I got to my Chicago years and was studying with, with even you know, more focused orchestral type players that were able to diagnose my problems and help me notice these things and, and think more broadly in music, you know, maybe, maybe I started to get some like sepia tones where now this picture is becoming even more detailed. Um, by the time I was, you know, playing several years in the civic orchestra, taking auditions, doing that, I was probably working now with like a full color palette but when I think about that versus now my perspective from the Met and, and all that I've learned there and, and kind of my experience of some of these works, that's the difference between like an 8-bit color palette and like a 24-bit color palette. Where the difference now is like you can still see the picture. Like at a certain point, you start to recognize Monet's haystacks. But toggling between these is like, oh, yeah, there is really so much more detail. This is all just kind of this maroon blob but when you get the full colors like oh yeah you see all the little shadows individual brush strokes and the way the sun plays on the top of this little pile of grass all of that is powering our ability to deliver ourselves even better feedback and it's also i mean for for anyone that spent any time on the orchestral auditioning track this this idea i think completely um, un undergirds the entire notion of blind orchestra auditions with excerpts, which is to say that, you know, the first couple auditions I took, I was like, wait, how is it possible that I'm going in to play like six minutes of music in a prelim round and people behind the screen are, are making these massively important decisions based on so little, like, how is this possible? Well, now that I've spent time on the other side of the screen, I get it, right? And, and the way I get it is, is understanding the perception element of this and how much you can determine from a very little amount. Um, we did an audition at the Met in 2016 and 17 where we were listening to the, the CD round submissions. So each CD had six excerpts, it was about seven minutes long. And in nearly every case, I only needed to hear the first three or four measures of the first excerpt before I was 90% certain how I was going to vote on that candidate. That seems crazy to people who are, are, are have not spent as much time with the process. But when I think about this and being able to see and determine a lot of this detail and, and make these fine discriminations, it all started to make a lot more sense to me. Second to last uh, idea here is that this all works within a framework of domain specific knowledge. Domain specific knowledge is basically what it says it is. It's, it's anything that we need to know, things you can write down, knowledge that's required to work in our field, in our craft. You know, for me, it's everything from you know, Mozart's birthday to like how to tuck a calfskin timpani head, things that you can write down instructions for. And if you've uh, actually, let me let me go back for a minute because um, if you've if you've ever watched the PBS show Sherlock, Sherlock talks about his mind palace. That's that's kind of this idea of all of the the knowledge that's required to do this thing. But the knowledge framework is kind of only where this begins. Um, 
because all of these pieces of information, they, they hang together on this framework, but they inform something else, something less tangible, but something that in my collaboration with Anders Ericsson, we really consider to be actually the most important element of deliberate practice. The, the thing that if, if feedback is this thing that, that a lot of people might be missing in inefficient practice, what it's all building toward is this thing called mental representations, sophisticated mental representations. They're difficult to define, but I'm gonna to try to do it two ways for here. Think of something that you play all the time. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a warm up. Maybe it's uh, you know a, a Bach prelude. Maybe it's a, a orchestral excerpt. Maybe it's a concert piece that you play all the time or something that, that gets incorporated in recitals, whatever it is. Think next about your own cookbook entry for how to recreate it. So imagine the recipe, you'd write down all the ingredients, all the steps, all of your decisions, everything you have to know about it. Like what is it that, that constitutes your interpretation and your vision for how you want to play this? But now, step three, actually take 10 or 15 seconds now, close your eyes and hear the most ideal possible performance of this in your mind's ear. Go ahead and do it right now. So if I'm interrupting your mental performance, I apologize, but, but that thing you're hearing, that is your mental representation, at least one manifestation of it. That, that ideal model, it is a conceptual representation of extreme detail and nuance that lives uniquely in your own mind. And we all have them for, for all kinds of different things we do. You know, far outside music, surgeons have these for imagining ideal surgeries and outcomes. And, and this is a, a generalized thing that psychologists have recognized. But the thing about it is, is that these mental representations actually evolve and grow with us as we invest more practice because our perception becomes more enhanced and we get pickier with ourselves. And so that ideal version continues to improve as well. I'm gonna show you also later some, some examples of how I've really tried to document that process for myself in, in an effort to intentionally refine my own representations to aid my performance. Um, but there's another way that might be helpful to think about these. And this is a somewhat more graphical approach to this. So, so indulge me for a minute. If you remember some basic middle school geometry, the definition of a line on an xy axis is just simply y equals mx plus b. And a lot of times when we think about work or progress, you know, we, we kind of think about things linearly by default. But if you change this up just a little bit, you get a shape that to me is this defining feature of artistic life where y equals negative m divided by x plus b gives us something that's called an asymptote. An asymptote is something that as it's moving forward, it approaches this point, the axis 100% or perfection and it keeps approaching it, but as it goes out to infinity, it never actually gets there. It just keeps getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And this very much mirrors my experience in music. I think there's a kind of philosophical argument to be made that this is kind of why we do this, this, this continuous effort to improve incrementally. And more specifically, my model for it is this, if, if we have deliberate practice effort and time here, and then we have some sort of artistic level that we're trying to improve over here. You will start from a current reality. And then we have this abstract idea of perfection up here that we can never actually reach. And in between, kind of like, you know, the carrot on a stick out in front of us, we have, we have this mental representation. This is where we are currently. This is where we perceive excellence being. It is the thing when you think of a piece or an excerpt or whatever, it was like, that is the most ideal version. And so you have that kind of existing above you. 
and you put in all of this work and, and you focus and you target your weaknesses and then you, you get it to that level. And in an almost agonizing way, once you get there, you realize the goalpost has moved. And now as your own mental representation has become more sophisticated and you've enhanced your perception along the way, you've gotten pickier, your destination is now above. And so you keep going back and forth in these like micro incremental processes, which kind of becomes this major definition of artistic life that we are forever asymptotically moving with more and more effort toward this unreachable perfection. Now, to be clear, um, I am not the only one who's experienced artistic growth in this way. In fact, uh, famously, the, the cellist Gregor Piotrgorsky said, the music remains above you. You're striving to reach it, and the better you become at it, the music moves higher. So it becomes unreachable. You have to give all your life only to discover that it's not enough. And I, I saw that quote and I was like, man, that is exactly right. That it, it's just this, I'm, I'm, I'm approaching the same thing graphically, but it's the same basic idea. Now, of course we, we understand too that, you know, life does not move in clean, smooth, asymptotic motion, right? It's really much more like this, <laughs> especially this past year, right? It was peaks, valleys, troughs, um, when you, you know, when I when I think about my experience, you zoom out far enough and the average motion kind of has this effect. Um, but yeah, you know, dealing with some of these downslides and plateaus and everything, that, that can be frustrating, um, emotionally difficult. And I, I want to put a pin in that because I'm going to circle back to that idea when I talk about one of my processes for recording and archiving and, and you know, dealing with my practice process in that way. And the way that my process for that became this source of emotional resilience and this kind of backstop to deal with some of the more frustrating elements of human emotion that inevitably crop up as you're going through this messier trajectory. And as it turns out, um, the author Seth Godin actually wrote a very short book about this exact shape. He called it the dip. And he was basically setting up the same idea. He was saying that in the beginning, you start off uh, you know, a brand new task and you learn a little bit of information about it and you get a lot better really quickly. And then, you know, this might be tennis or golf or chess or something like that. And then you keep putting in more work and like, yeah, it, it, you get to a point where it starts to take a lot more effort to get these incremental gains of improvement. And his point with this book is that yeah, that's the, then as it starts to get harder and harder, that's a point where a lot of people quit. And that, you know, to then keep powering through that dip to the kind of pro and then elite regimes of different activities, it requires this extra dedication and commitment and willpower. And, you know, he's, he's basically describing deliberate practice that is driven by intrinsic motivation. So getting back then to our framework, we've got this kind of one page snapshot of all of this. Um, there's a lot more to drill into there, but that, that to me is this recipe for your real gourmet practicing. And it is really the, the one page that if I can summarize how I was able to go from a nanotechnologist to somebody even in contention for winning an audition like a place at the Met, it was this, it was, it was just the way I was practicing. Now, you can also simplify this. You could boil this down into a shorter workflow. And I'm gonna do it like this. I'm gonna say, all right, you've got these steps where in the beginning you isolate a, a technical or a musical problem, and then you brainstorm some solutions, some practice techniques and assess which may work the best. As I was describing before, then you record yourself, you play for other people, you solicit feedback, maybe from a teacher, and then finally, you analyze this all. You determine, like, did this work? Am I going to do more of this? Do I need to change tracks? You document this, right? You archive it. You put it in a practice journal. Put it in some of the other uh, places I'm going to show you the, the way that I did this for myself. Now, a, a workflow like this seems fairly intuitive. You know, I've, I've done versions of this talk 
all around the world for years now. And I have yet to, to hear anybody protest and say, oh, that seems like a really stupid way to practice. Like most people can genuinely agree. Like, yeah, those are, those are good practice habits. Cool. The punchline for this and where it really comes back to my initial statement of what deliberate practice is, is that it's just literally the scientific method step by step, right? Where you formulate a question and a hypothesis prediction, you get a data experiment and then you analyze the results. It's no surprise then that when researchers like Erickson and other psychologists were going around to look at the methods of improvement that were very similar and shared across you know, expert performers in a lot of different fields, this is what they found. And it maybe shouldn't be surprising, right? Because, well, the scientific method, it, yeah, sure, there's all of these aspects of, of music and artistic things that are subjective. They're non-empirical. Totally get it. We can talk a lot about that. But processes for improving, right? And, the, and some of the technical and objective aspects of playing, I mean, they are wide open to this systematic scientific approach because it's not just for, you know, virology or quantum mechanics or gene sequencing. It is a way of thinking and it's specifically a way of problem solving. The scientific method is the most powerful problem solving mindset humans have developed. And yeah, I, I think we shouldn't be surprised then to realize like, oh, this is the basic idea that unites all of these different approaches across different fields for people who are getting good at stuff. And, you know, I, I can say that too, from this perspective of having experienced this process similarly in two seemingly different facets of my life. Back, back when I was working my nanotech job, um, I was, I was really attuned to the way in, in a lot of tech environments, there's a job description called process engineer. And, you know, process engineering very briefly, it's again, just kind of this step-by-step -step workflow where you look at a big picture, you audit it, you determine where to make improvements and increase efficiency, and then you implement these changes and you repeat. And this can happen in pharmaceuticals, it can happen in software companies, it happens all over the place. And the interesting thing is it doesn't necessarily require specific domain knowledge of the thing you're working on. It is, it is an, an attention to process, not unlike the way we work on things in music. And so, you know, in both cases, right, whether it's the tech industry, whether it's a music process, it's working to build more sophisticated mental representations of this whole thing. You know, in, in physics, for example, where we had an approach where like my, my, my courses were set up in this kind of corkscrew approach where physics 101 is doing like Newtonian mechanics. Physics 202 is doing a lot of the same stuff, but at higher levels with more sophisticated math. 303, okay, now we're doing computer simulations and a lot of the stuff, but it, it's, it's kind of going back over the same material with increasing sophistication. And man, like that, that's, that's totally my experience of coming back to some of these same pieces, you know, timpani parts and Beethoven or Mahler, revisiting it with now a, a more sophisticated understanding of what I can be doing. Um, you know, I say that musicians can be excellent process engineers because we're already doing it. And in fact, you know, it, it goes beyond all of this. The, the, the act of deliberate practice also means that you are capable of doing a very specific kind of work. And the author and computer science professor at Georgetown, Cal Newport, wrote an entire book about this. He called it Deep Work. He says in this book, to master a cognitively demanding task requires deliberate practice. There are few exceptions made for natural talent. He says, yeah, deliberate practice's core components are usually identified as your attention is focused tightly on a specific skill you're trying to improve or an idea you're trying to master. And then you receive feedback so you can correct your approach to keep your attention exactly where it's most productive. A lot of times I encounter analogies saying like, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, Google Maps on your phone where you're a little blue dot and you're getting constant feedback on course corrections like, no, 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 turn here, no, 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 here your destination. Okay, now reroute. It's a useful analogy, I think. He goes on to say that the reason why it's so important to focus intensely on the task at hand while avoiding distract distraction, such as keep your phone in airplane mode, 
is because it's the only way to isolate the relevant neural circuit enough to trigger useful myelination. Again, this process that involves the protein insulating our brain wires. He says to be great at something is to be well myelinated. So by the end of the book, Newport has basically made the, the rather audacious claim, which I fully endorse. And that is that, A, the most useful and valuable kind of work is deep work in any domain, any discipline. B, he goes on to say that changes in personal technology, such as smartphones and social media, have degraded personal work habits in corporate culture to the extent that deep work is very difficult to pull off, very difficult to maintain. And thus, C, um, the most valuable kinds of workers, regardless of prior training or degrees or technical specialty, are deep workers. And we musicians are, by our very nature and training, deep workers. If we are, if we are practicing well and efficiently, deliberately, we're doing deep work. And this is very powerful. Because again, you know, recall the scientific method here, right? It's a method of problem solving. Um, and, and, you know, I often think that there's kind of no job worth doing that does not involve some sort of problem solving. And so when I've talked about how deliberate practice can give musicians versatile skills, especially to help weather turbulent times like we're living through, what I mean is this, it, it's, it's derived from our process and our approach to problem solving. And what I mean by this further is that because we are most inclined to be doing deep work compared to a lot of other kind of workers in the world, this can be an extremely powerful thing to leverage, right? And in terms of what some of this, you know, diversity of skill and, 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 um, versatility can look like, right? I, I, I really, I feel like I need to focus on this because by default, so much of musical training can be very narrowly focused, right? You know, conservatories are trade school, basically. I mean, it's a vocational education. Um, it, it, can, it can have this kind of tunnel vision approach to the world and, and learning and it can often neglect some really, really important things for a, a broader education. And, you know, it's, it's not just my opinion, right? Like so many of my friends and colleagues along the way have said some variation of like, oh man, I'm so stressed out or I'm so worried because like all I know how to do is, is play the violin or, or, or play piano or play the cello or something, right? Like I'm so unemployable. And even, you know, 15 years ago, I, I would hear that and be like, well, I get what you're saying, but like, that's, that's really selling yourself short. Like that's it's pretty unfair because what you're doing when you're practicing is actually something really sophisticated if you're doing it well. And especially, if, you know, with this understanding of deep work and focus and all of the attributes of deliberate practice, I think about this and I, and I think, well, okay, maybe we have this musician experience of understanding the zoom levels of large structures, you know, so from, from Sonata Allegro form, or, you know, understanding the sort of early, middle, late period of, of Beethoven's work, down to understanding, like zoom way in to a single note, like in the second movement of Beethoven three Eroica, there's this one C at the very end of it, that's just like this beautiful single note. And I, I've spent weeks thinking about what this means, <laughs> and like how to play it and get the best tone and the shape and context, right? We're going through these big, big zoom levels of, of attention to different things. It, it's the ability to have, you know, great attention to detail coupled with the ability to not lose the forest for the trees. Well, the, the real world skill of that is, you know, like literally every business executive, legislature, you know, legislator, public policy expert, engineer, doctor, lawyer, like this is an important thing to be able to do. Moving on from this, what about the ability to be, you know, analytical? So that's like, what is the harmonic movement of this passage? And then simultaneously creative and spontaneous and, and associative. I would say, again, that's like virtually every engineering director, marketing director, advertising executive, branded consultant, intellectual property lawyer, Right? There's that famous scene in Mad Men 
when Don Draper has this revelation of the carousel. Um, the, the real deliberate practice hero of the entire show, I would say, is Peggy Olson. Like, what an incredible character and, and sort of incarnation of these ideas. Or we could, we could go on and we could say, the ability to be persistently analytical with overly familiar material. What I mean by that is like coming back to it and not just seeing the same thing, but always being able to uncover new details, constantly probing deeper, reconsulting the score, rewriting a part, arranging new parts, being you know, a part music librarian, persistently asking questions and investigating. I mean, that's the work of being an actual librarian. It's also 98% of software coding. <laughs> you know? um, a lot of technical writing, copy editing, detectives, FBI agents, IRS auditors, inspectors general, criminal prosecutors. I'll keep going. What about rehearsing, right? Running simulations, fixating on certain ideas, areas to fix, places to improve the overall experience. Well, again, that's like 98% of software coding is debugging and then running simulations to figure out why is it not working. What about the ability to emote and, and communicate through multiple dimensions with appropriate pacing and energy arcs and, and keen awareness of dynamic extremes for maximum impact, okay? We do this all the time as musicians. That's also all public speaking and orators, education, teaching, again, marketing, product demonstrations. My, my first job title in the nanotech company was applications engineer, had huge components of this. I would also say that it's the ability to emote and communicate under extreme and withering pressure, right? With the looming threat of, of profound embarrassment or, or public humiliation, right? There's this, this, you know, managing performance anxiety and, and grappling with performance psychology side of this, which again, if we, spend the time and we develop these skills. When we are skilled at this, it's not surprising that like so many other civilians, people not in the music world, think about what we do and they're like, they're terrified, right? There's that famous story of when uh, that, that reporter who had you know covered battles in Vietnam went to go play triangle in the New York Philharmonic under Lenny, uh, Bernstein conducting. And he was like, yeah, that was the most terrifying experience of my life. What about then crafting a phrase, right? So that it fits into a longer arc and then crafting that longer arc so that it tells a broader story. Again, we do this as musicians all the time. And that is basically all writing and all narrative development ever, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, TV, movies, books, poetry, blogs, magazines, even reality shows, right? You might think about programming, right? So assembling compelling repertoire for recital, concert, even an entire season. And that is also very much aligned with audio video production, directing, editing, the producer title in general, sales and, sales and marketing campaigns, again. Finally, what about this experience of, you know, feeling like part artist, but also part therapist, if you're in a chamber ensemble and kind of managing these relationships, part corporate cog, you know, sometimes like I feel at the, at the Met where you have to kind of manage up and you're part of this big machine, part stagehand, right? If you have to do a lot of rehearsal setup, a part acoustician when I'm getting to a new hall and testing out sticks and being like, okay, what's going to work here? And how, how does this sound? And part philosopher, part physical therapist as you're dealing with possibly rep repetitive stress injuries. Well, this is also literally Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. Um, in 1983, so Howard Gardner is this developmental psychologist, uh, and he described these, these nine different types of intelligence. Uh, he, he runs through them. The, the interesting thing is that um, it's naturalist, mus uh, musical, logical, mathematical, existential, interpersonal, bodily, kinesthetic, linguistic, interpersonal, spatial. So he's got all these different ways that he, he has defined intelligence, and he puts musical as a separate one, but I see that I'm like, well, wait, but you know, we do all of those things. So he developed these ideas back in the 1980s. Uh, if you've ever heard of the, the EQ, sort of the idea of emotional intelligence, um, that's, that's from his work. Now, around the same time, another blockbuster researcher in psychology was investigating not just how expertise is acquired, but different kinds of expertise and how they differ, and notably where they fail. 
And this researcher was one of the primary and earliest contributors to the realm of cognitive fallacies. And if, you, if, if you've encountered this before, you might know a cognitive fallacy is something like confirmation bias, you know, where you only accept information that confirms your, your pre-existing beliefs. So this researcher is Dan Kahneman. He wrote this book recently called Thinking Fast and Slow, another one I really highly recommend. And so he, he spent his career researching and indexing cognitive fallacies and then exploring where that led. Um, I think there are two others that have had a very direct bearing on talking about deliberate practice, specific, uh, specifically in the COVID era. And those are the illusion of skill and the illusion of validity. And in this book, he talks about that there are entire industries built on illegitimate expertise or, or what I just more simply call bullshit expertise. He also says, yeah, there are entire industries built on legitimate expertise. And he cites doctors, nurses, medical staff, and musicians. So what does this mean? Well, I think, you know, as musicians, we know what legitimate expertise looks like. We, we enact it as musicians. We experience it with doctors. We, we've sort of seen this whole case study of it in the last 13 months. Illegitimate bullshit expertise is something a little more interesting. So in the book, he talks about the study he did with professional investors. And he said that professional investors, including fund managers, fail a basic test of skill, and that is persistent achievement. The diagnostic for the existence of any skill is the consistency of individual differences and achievement. And in reality, when he went in and did this study at a bank, he got, surprisingly, the, the training records for years and years and years of all of these very highly paid fund managers. And what he discovered is that over time, they don't beat the market. In fact, they do worse. This was one of the first major things that led to the idea of passive investing, index investing, a lot of a lot of different ideas about that now in finance. But the other interesting thing was that, you know, he concluded like, wow, it, it looks like this major industry appears to be built largely on an illusion of skill. And he brought this report to the executives of the bank. And they said, thank you very much. And they <laughs> threw it right in the trash because they were like, yeah, this undermines kind of our entire existence. So we can't do anything with this. It's interesting because Kahneman's assessment of this is basically saying that expertise comes from demonstrable differences in skill. It's also obvious that bullshit expertise dominates in a lot of different areas, sometimes with catastrophic consequences. So last summer, I wrote this blog post that was just titled, the most teachable area, uh, the most teachable era in human history for the necessity of expertise. And my God, like the months intervening, you, you couldn't ask for a more direct case study of like why expertise is so important. I've also talked a lot lately about how, you know, in the midst of this uncertainty that we're living through and this, this murky future, I do believe that whatever the world looks like post COVID, it's gonna require overwhelming legitimate expertise to get us back on a positive trajectory. The craft of being a musician absolutely falls under legitimate expertise and tying these ideas all together then, right? With, with Kahneman and Cal Newport and Deep Work and Erickson and deliberate practice, deliberate practice is the process of cultivating legitimate expertise in any discipline. And so I believe it may well be the best possible recipe for ensuring adaptability in a post-COVID world, whether we're musicians or pivoting to something else, leveraging our versatility, that's it. I wanna take the last 25 minutes or so now to walk you through some of the examples of how I applied deliberate practice in my own process. This covers, yeah, the time frame from around 2008, absolutely up through the Met Opera audition, and then very much including my ongoing work at the Met. And 
So again, as I'm going through some of these applications, I, I want to be as clear as possible. These are not meant to be rigidly prescriptive ideas. They are, they are how they appeared for me in my context, in my specific domain of you know, orchestral music and opera. I hope what's clear is that they are showing examples of this framework and how it might look to you in your own implementations. So rather than thinking about it like a straitjacket, it's just sort of guidelines, suggestions. And again, you know, none of these are magic bullets, right? I can't, like I said in the first session, nobody can promise you outcomes here. Nobody can promise you a, a you know, job working out or an audition win or any of this. But um, the, the first one now is, is getting back to that idea that I, I put a pin in before about how self-recording and our process of archiving and learning from this can have several really important functions. One of them being this ongoing resilience to get us through the, the peaks and valleys and troughs and plateaus. Um, and, and again, be this kind of emotional backstop, insurance against that. So the idea is that when you're doing this process, it's still gonna be inefficient if you're not documenting and tracking. And what I mean by that is that I was finding as I was you know, really dedicating myself to this and keeping some practice journals and, and going months and then years and then multiple years, I was having to return to material and then kind of forgetting what I'd been doing with it. I didn't know where I left off. I was forgetting major decisions I'd made about interpretation or technique. And, you know, and, and that was just like, oh man, I'm like reinventing the wheel here. This is silly. So that also then relates to this idea of like, how do you keep the faith and not get discouraged with what can sometimes feel like this glacial pace of improvement or progress. And my answer for that was evidence, right? I just, I just needed to give myself evidence, have a way and a process to accumulate this evidence for myself. There are two basic pillars to this idea then. The first is what I've already mentioned, um, self-recording, right? This idea that, that it's a consistent, ideally daily routine of getting high quality audio, preferably with video, the point of which is then analysis as part of our workflow that's the scientific method. The second part of this is a little less obvious. It's this archival method and a systematic way to keep track of your various self-recordings and your notes and your research and your homework and your lessons, all of the domain-specific notes, all of the stuff that's accumulating over a long period of time, years. On the first point, I'm going to kind of just say it, 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 I, I, it should be basically self-evident that you need devices to do this and that self-recording is a really, really important way of giving yourself feedback. It's this kind of cornerstone of the deliberate practice process. In my opinion, I'm not you know, an endorser or anything, but these, these are some of the, the devices I use that, that are relatively affordable and, and really high quality. Um, so there's another aspect to this. And I just want to highlight this briefly because as I've been working with students in the last few years, it's something I've come to insist upon. And that is a deliberate lesson approach. I, there's a podcast I did with Noah Kageyama of, of Bulletproof Musician where we talk about this. But the basic idea is here is that, you know, we, we refine our craft through lessons. They're absolutely essential. Lesson hours are precious, right? There's only 120 for all of undergrad. But it's also really rare that people, you know, ever get a sit down. It's like, hey, you're going to spend a lot of time and money taking a license in your life. So here's how to have a really, really good one. To me, it's imperative to maximize that value. Really make those lesson hours count. Squeeze as much as possible from them, which means at a minimum, the first step is you got to record the entire lesson, at least audio, preferably video. Of course, you need permission for this, but it's my assessment at this point that very, very few teachers are resistant to this idea because it's just such a no-brainer. Then you got to listen back to this, right? It's, it's not enough to just record and keep it in the can. There's a couple benefits to this, right? When, when I know that I'm recording the thing, I can be much, much more engaged during the lesson. We get a lot more done. I'm not sitting there as my teacher says something and I'm scribbling something down quickly and then missing the next thing they're saying. So we, we get more done at the time. Then I go back and I listen through it and I take all of the notes then basically generating a written transcript. 
I then go back and re-listen to any particularly revelatory moment so I can break it down and deconstruct, like what were they talking about? And then I organize all of this stuff topically for later reference. I'll, I'll talk more about that in just a minute. You'll see what, I'm, what I do with that. But you know, what, one of the big points here is that when I started doing this for myself, man, I was, I was getting so much more done in lessons. Because I really think, I mean, both my experience of this and then working with students that have and have not done this, if we're not doing this kind of approach, a deliberate lesson, we're not capturing it, you only retain maybe 20, 25% of what's actually going on in the lesson. There's just so much of it goes over your head. And it was the same way for me. This, this approach for me got me a lot closer, not, not to 100, but 85, 90 pretty consistently. And that was massively important for my trajectory. It's all this part of self-recording and archiving. But let me talk now about this archival method. Because again, the idea is that like we have all of these other areas of our life where things get archived for our reference. Um, in my case, this, this emerged kind of organically because I had this three ring binder of uh, timpani music that I was working from, put them in plastic sheet protectors. And I'd scribble on the music and then eventually my music was too messy and full. So I started putting post-it notes on the plastic sheet protector. And then that started to cover up the whole page. And it was just insane because I would come back to something six months, 12 months later, and I wouldn't remember what I was doing. I would have conflicting notes to be like, okay, use this stick. No, 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 use this stick. Take this tempo. No, 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 take this tempo. And I was like, wait, which was it? I, I'm keeping lousy records here. Dang it. And so what I ended up doing is, again, was sort of necessity being the mother of invention, I just started taking a lot of these recordings and putting them in a collected place in iTunes and then putting all of those notes there. So it looked like this. It ended up being a playlist. And you can see how I just had this, you know, Adams through Beethoven and onward. I just called this thing the can, you know, because like in Hollywood, they're like, yep, yeah, it's done. It's in the can. Boom. Good to go. And Man, I gotta tell you, this was like one of the most powerful tool things that I implemented in my deliberate practice process because I started with just a few, right? It was just like six little things in there and then it was like nine and then 12. And I started putting more information in there and the, the entries got more sophisticated and more informed and the list grew. And the list grew eventually to incorporate all 406 entries here that, that comprise the you know sort of totality of my timpani auditioning repertoire work. But the point is that each individual one of these entries, we zoom in on the Beethoven area here. Each one of these is a sound file. There's a video file that goes with it. And there's a story. Each one of these things has a story, which I you know eventually had to just accept like my short-term memory is chemically incapable of remembering in every detail. And my long-term memory was not well organized enough to be able to get it all on demand. And if we zoom in to what any individual one of these stories looks like, that's this next page. So not only is this, you know, comprehensively looking at the repertoire I was working on, but each one of those things has a chronology. So what you're seeing on this page is like the best of version of any of these individual pieces, excerpts, et cetera. And that's the best of is essentially the last one on the list, but I've been accumulating these for years. This is, this is my progression going from you know, 2010 up through like 2012 in this instance. And when I talk about like this emotional backstop, you know, we all have tough days in the practice room, days where we, we doubt ourselves, we doubt our abilities, like, oh my God, I'm just such a hack, like, what am I doing? But when I'm having one of those moments, I can go back and I can listen to this and I can say, you know, I might feel bad about this right now, but I can listen to this like three and a half year progression of my work on one thing. And in the span of like 12 minutes, I hear it going from what now to my more enhanced ears, like, wow, pretty bad to, okay, yeah, that's pretty good. The point is not to make myself feel miserable that, that I was playing badly before. It's that no, like at that point in time, that was legitimate. That, that was where I was. In 2010, that was my best of take. And I was rightfully proud of that. And then it got better and it got better again. And so this, this is really a roadmap of improvement. 
in all of these different dimensions of, of the work I'm doing. More specifically, when you look at this guy, the latest and greatest version of this, the story lives in, in these notes then that I put in the file. So you can you can annotate this, all, all of the different metadata, you can you know give it specific names. I have comments here about the kinds of exercises I'm using to practice that. You'll see that pop up in my video here in just a minute. You can include the actual, uh, the, the image of the music itself that can just live in the MP3 file. And then finally, in the lyrics tab here, you can, you can put an infinite amount of text. And this text is my entire story, my whole work on the excerpt, all of the decisions I've made about it, you know, everything ranging from target tempi to the, the mallets I'm using and, and the maybe the timpani tuning scheme, the, the different performance notes I have to myself on, on stickings or muffling technical things, um, you know, the, the, the countermeasures I've brainstormed for what things tend to go wrong with this and how I'm going to work on those things, my aesthetic and artistic vision. You know, sometimes I have information about the different editions that are out there in print. Importantly, I have all of my feedback right? Feedback that comes from teachers, from mock audition committees, and from myself. And so that with each one of these incremental improvements, I'm saying, I've got this version. It's better than the previous one in these ways that I'm documenting right here. And yet I'm still hearing these things in my current mental representation of this that, that I'm going to try to improve upon for next time. That all lives in there in my story. It's a huge amount of information. But the fact that it's a huge amount of information reiterates to me why it's so powerful for me to have this resource. You know, if nothing else, I know that my work exists. It didn't just evaporate into thin air and sound. It's also really useful as a teacher because when I inevitably have students that come back to me and they're like, hey, I wanna play this thing for you. And they play something that it's honestly been five or six years since I've, I've looked at. And I'm like, oh. And, you know, I remember as a student doing this for certain teachers and now I know like their reaction was like, oh yeah, just do this and that. And, and they're, they're kind of bullshitting, right? Because they don't remember, it's been too long. And instead of doing that, I can say, hey, cool, great question. I'm gonna take 40 seconds, pop up my archive, watch the video of myself doing it. And man, it just, it snaps all right back. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. I do it this way. And I made this decision. Ah, yeah, and I did it because of this, this, and this, and that connects to this idea and the other part of the work. Okay, great. Now we can have an informed lesson about this. So it's, it's a ton of work that goes into this. It was this kind of work that I considered to be homework time. It was, it was all of the extra work that I was doing outside the practice room to augment my main practice process. Um, when we're talking about myelin, when we're talking about focus and concentration, you know, it, it's there's a lot of research out there that suggests four to five hours is about the most you can get in any given day for like super highly concentrated focused activity. And after that, you, your brain just, it runs out of myelin, it runs out of all the, the, the ability to keep doing this. And we kind of, we hit the wall. Well, one of the ways I worked around that for myself was, yeah, I did all that time, and then I could put in another couple hours doing a lower brain drain activity, like maintaining my archive, putting things in there, annotating it, getting all the notes from this document and from my lesson transcript, and maybe you know doing the lesson transcript so that I could come back the next day with a more powerful process. Now, this connects to one of the other ideas about how I was managing that time. Because as I mentioned, like, yeah, the, you, you were working with time constraints. All of us are anytime, right? Ideally, we get four to five hours of practice in the day. But like, boy, I mean, <laughs> I, I haven't even had access to my timpani for 13 months. So like, wh what can I say about that? And the opera season is very busy, right? So we're all dealing with real life. I want to then walk you through just a kind of case study in, in time management, because um, in, my, in my experience, there really is just the kind of one fundamental factor that is so much more important than you know, where you went to school or your teacher or how young you started playing. And that is discipline time management skills. It's a huge part of this. I'm going to use an example of an orchestral audition list because it's something tangible and concrete. But 
imagine that this could be truly anything. It could be recital preparation. It could be, you know, getting ready for a job interview and going through a lot of these practice questions. Anything where you need to manage your time and then make some prioritization decisions. So this was from, you know, the real life situation back in 2012 when I was auditioning for the Detroit Symphony. And often the lists look like this, where it's just like, okay, Beethoven 9, the whole thing. Strauss burlesque, the whole thing. It's like, okay, well, this is not actionable, right? This is often the kind of thing you get from an orchestra person. I'm a manager for, for an audition, but you can't work with this. You gotta, you gotta start somewhere else. And so my first step is to deconstruct it into the askable spots, right? So I create the separate list for myself that has 104 different entries of like, these are the actual excerpts, the bits that I'm gonna focus on. How do you determine this? Well, this comes from experience, domain specific knowledge and asking teachers and asking other people, like what are the things that tend to get asked in these works? Now, it goes beyond that because there's also the history of all of these audition lists. So I went through and I just said, okay, well, how many times has a given one of these spots appeared on different audition lists in the last like 20 years? And the answer is something like Mozart 39, in my case was 37 times versus something like Siegfried's Funeral March, only 13 times. It's like, hmm, that's interesting. That might imply something about how relevant these different things are or how useful they are to an audition committee. But let's go a step further. In my 28 auditions, I kept track of which ones were actually asked in audition rounds. And that created a much different list. And it led me to the conclusion that like, yeah, these excerpts, they are not all created equal. Because over this whole time frame, 28 auditions, something like Beethoven 9 got asked 16 times, you know, over half the auditions I played, I played that excerpt, versus anything from this point and below was asked once or never. Which is interesting because that means there's this cluster at the top that gets asked all of the time. And then this long tail of stuff that's rarely asked. This is important because I know this same behavior exists for all the other instruments in the orchestra. I have a generally rough idea of what those excerpts are and they're sort of their, their priority scheme. And, you know, the, the interesting thing to me about this is that, yes, you have to work through the whole list. You have to know all this stuff. You have to practice all of this stuff. But I mean, my goodness, like these, these are the greatest hits and they really matter. And I would suggest that, you know, if you are, doing orchestral auditions, you would be crazy not to wait more of your preparation time to these. Because it has also now been my experience on the other side of the screen that these greatest hits get asked the most frequently because they demonstrate the most information in the shortest amount of time. They're really high quality, dense, you know, windows into somebody's playing. And by practicing those and picking apart all of those problems in my process, I was putting the priority where it needed to be on the most important stuff, the hardest stuff, the most revealing stuff. And, and I, I did that in the following way that I, I wanna show you. I think it's useful to see this. When I talk about how I'm gonna pick this apart, I'm kind of talking about now this intense core deliberate practice time, which in any preparation timeline, could be six weeks, could be 12, right? For me, I always had a, a, a phase where I then started to ramp from like solitary practice into playing for others and doing mocks and then and then tampering, right? And, and really just thinking this is now about headspace. I've done the work. I just need to go perform my best. That's a very common approach in music and athletics and, and all these different kinds of places, marathon preparation, right? But so this, this could be, this core practice time could be three weeks, could be 16 weeks. So what am I doing in there? Well, I am managing my time according to my highest priorities. And I built a scheduling practice calculator for myself. And I wanna show you that quickly. I wanna show you how that works. So let me reshare a different screen. I'm just gonna show you the actual spreadsheet itself. So here it is. You can see I've still got basically the same kind of list. So I've got the excerpts here. I've got an importance scale, 
which in my case is, yeah, how many times was it asked in the audition? For you, you can, you can derive this, you can make some estimates, right? The importance can, can be, you know, how hard is it? How revealing is it? Um, how many times are you gonna play this thing? And then here's, here's where you get some critical self-analysis, being honest with yourself, like what is the status condition report, right? And for me, this is a simple three-point scale, either pretty good shape, medium, or boy, this is critical, this needs work. Then with some simple spreadsheet math, I'm giving myself a weighted status, which is quite literally just this number times the importance from which we kind of get this total number and derive what percentage of your practice time you should probably be spending on that thing based on its importance. On the corner of my sheet then, I just plug in like how many hours do I have to work with in a week per day? How many weeks is this plan? You can change any of this. You can do three hours. You can do four days a week. It should update as we're going and goes from 24 to 18 or we can go back to 24. And this final bit now is just saying like, yeah, how many hours, but also how many chunks of time am I working with? I, I, I arrived at the system, which you'll see in a second, which is, I found it useful to work on about two chunks of material per hour. 25 minutes was just, I, I found to be a good amount of time to focus on something. Less than that, I, I was kind of skimming the surface. More than that, I would start to kind of spin my wheels and, and get burned out on it. And so I just had this rule of thumb, not a straight jacket, but rule of thumb that I was working on two things per hour. And this then tells me, okay, how, how many of these chunks of time am I gonna work on something in a given week? The next step is just a cool little Chrome plugin, takes this list, takes these numbers and spits it out into my Google calendar. It's a, it's a little thing called Eventomatic, but it actually creates the calendar entries here that you see. It's a one click uh, process and you can see it then over here. I just need to go back to, I think this spit it out. Yeah, there we go. So it, it, it puts it first in a simple, uh, just a stack right here. You can see oh, there's all the stuff that I need to be practicing. And then I just use my own judgment and I start to drag these things around into my calendar where I have my open practice time to say, all right, I think it makes sense to practice this stuff together that morning. On Monday evening, I'm gonna practice the excerpts that go dunk it up, right? So Beethoven seven, Beethoven nine, Scherzo, Tchaikovsky four, Symphony first movement. Things that have similar problems where in focusing on some of these problems together, I can kind of knock out multiple birds with one stone. And again, this is, this is I, it's flexible. I can always change these plans. I reorient this, I can add more time if I need to but it at least gives me a smart starting point for this. Because again, the, the idea is I, I need to be flexible with these plans, but I wanna be efficient too. And so, so when we go back to our initial, that, that very first point with the deliberate practice framework of that it needs to be in, you know, intentionally designed. Well, I mean, this, this is what I'm talking about. That's, that's how I achieved it for myself. Going from something that is an unactionable list from a personnel manager to a prioritization scheme that now lives in my calendar and giving me a way to actually implement this, like that is what I mean by designed practice. The final step now in the last couple minutes is cool. So what am I actually doing in one of those chunks of time? I've done all the support work, done all this planning, done some archiving and some taking notes and lessons, but then like, what does that individual 25 minute chunk of time really look like? Couple rules I have for that. In one of these 25 minute chunks, I'm basically moving from drilling and practice through to performance and then analysis. I was working with exercises that I had developed myself or with you know, the aid of a teacher to focus on the specific weaknesses that I had identified. I kept track of those in my archive so that I could come to it and instantly know what my plan was gonna be. I would take time to then drill those exercises, sometimes recording them and, and listening back to just the exercises, sometimes doing those as sort of a review session to then implement back into the sort of synthesis of the floor work. Then I start to definitely record that 
analyze it and see like what kind of progress have I made. And if, I, if I'm at the end now of a span of work and I've made really good progress, this recording becomes a candidate for the next best thing in my archive. Displaces the old one, that's the new one. That's the new gold standard. And then I document all of this, right? I will take time either in that moment or after my practice session to keep track of those notes. What did I change? What am I hearing? Is this, you know, the new greatest? And so I have a, a full 25 minute long video of what that process looks like for a, a Beethoven timpani excerpt. But what I've done is I've showed it in time lapse. So you'll see some of the critical moments of what I'm doing and then speeding through some of the repetition. So I'm going to share that with you right now. Right here. And there it is. So that's what that can look like. And at least one manifestation of that, one incarnation. Um, I know that's actually a ton of stuff I blew through in the last like 25 minutes or so, but I hope it's helpful to, to see how these ideas in this framework can then become kind of incarnated in this workflow and, and what that really looks like. So I'd like to wrap it up there. Um, I know we're at time and I would be more than happy to hang out and discuss and answer any questions you guys have. And thanks for your attention.
Jason, this is just so great to to hear the way that you that you uh, have really worked this out, you know, and that that it's it's so methodical. And and uh, I recognize a lot of the my own practice techniques when I got to be very serious about getting a job. Um, and uh, you know, just seeing you even 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 take it to the next level in terms of using technology to um, keep track of everything, you know, um, I think that's really great. I, th I think that really is kind of the the missing piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know that that uh, we actually have a, a a scientist, a fellow scientist on uh, on the call tonight. It, it's a great. Um, friend and supporter of the festival, Steve Schiff. And he put a couple comments in the chat um, that I just wanted to refer back to. Um, he says, hi, Jason, great discussion. Myelin is not, however, a protein. It is special cells that insulate your neurons. We don't think that this is very changeable, but the strength of the connections is very changeable. Makes no ah. difference in your recommendations. Um, and then, uh, after the discussion about Newport, he says, poor Newport, his writing and thoughts are great. Superb computer scientist, his fundamental neuroscience is a bit flaky. Fundamental message is unchanged, fortunately. And Steve sent me a private message to say that he was just really enjoying this talk. So just to, um, just wanted to, to refer back to those. Great. I, so I, I'm curious about this. Steve, if you're still here, um, I think may, maybe I got confused by some of the Wikipedia I was, I was doing on this, but this was one of the entries I was working from uh, where it's, let's see, bring that back. It's just called uh, myelin basic protein. And it was talking about the, 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 the sheath that goes around these, um, as you, as you described the, you know, in, insulating these, these connections, but I, if, so it's not, wh what part of it isn't a protein? Maybe that's one, something I, I would love to know for my own understanding. If, if you're still around or Steve, able Steve to. is around. Uh, although he just, oh, there he is. There's Steve. Hey, Steve. I'm trying. Hi, everyone. Yeah, no, great discussion. Uh, it's, uh, I kind of do neuroscience from my day job. So the myelin is really cells that wrap around your neurons and make insulation. And there is a myelin basic protein that's associated with them, but it's probably the junctions between those nerve cells that do the learning that you're talking about. We don't think the myelin insulation itself is terribly changeable, um, but I'm always willing to learn new things if uh, there's uh -huh, okay. knowledge involved. Uh, but, but the fundamentals that you're talking about are just so compelling. And I oh, really, thank you. I really, really appreciate your discussion. That's awesome. So, so is it? I, yeah, because I'm, I'm, I always want to be as accurate as possible when I'm describing this. Is it? Is it then more accurate to say that myelin is the adjective that describes the the cells that are composed of, among other things, myelin basic protein? I would probably just scratch the whole myelin discussion out of it. And okay. it's the strength of the connections, which so far as I understand, probably has um, not much to do with the myelin itself. You get your brain myelinated by the time you're about three years old. And that's well before you've done any serious deliberate practice. Depends on what kind of parents you have. <laughs> that's true. I won't get into that. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Yeah, and and Steve Steve is a really great neuroscientist and also a super uh, enthusiastic uh, violist and supporter of the arts. Oh, that's great. So, yeah. so where where do you work or where where have you worked? Oh, I'm at Penn State, and my okay. job is doing science, and I work on on a variety of things like infant infections. But uh, my passion in the evening when I I, I, I don't have to work is uh, music and trying to desperately play a little music. That's and great. I play in an amateur orchestra here in town. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Um, I know that, that uh, Jason is really open to questions and would love to hear um, all of your questions. I, I recognize quite a few of you. Um, so if you have questions, turn yourself, turn your camera on and, and shoot away. 
Jason. Hi, this is Lindy. Hey, Lindy. Hi. Um, I teach at NC State University. And okay. Also play the uh, orchestra, Peter Conduct. Um, I myself been tried for audition for so many years. Um, several method. I mean, I kind of pick it up here, there, and uh, some method you suggest that I'm kind of familiar with it. Um, but I think that your speech probably is the most comprehensive I ever heard. Oh, cool. So, Thank you. Yeah. And uh, it's just so systematic. I mean, it's really, I mean, no wonder you're really very successful. So um, if I want to follow your work or I want to dive deeper, how can I find you or any uh, group you might suggest me kind of just plug in so I can continue get inspiration or get a, the yeah. knowledge? Absolutely. I'll, I'll drop mm -hmm. a couple things here in the chat. So um, first of all, we've got I just beat uh, we, you to it for a couple, yep, couple of things. You got, you got that. Um, we have a uh, deliberate practice Facebook group where there is some fairly regular discussion of these ideas. That's um, it's especially interesting to me as people bring questions to it and and insights you know that I maybe haven't worked through or you know things that haven't occurred to me. And it's it's kind of a great place where I continue to to learn about that. The Facebook group link is here, okay. um, so you can check that out. Okay. Um, I also have a series of blog posts about this where um, I, I go into more detail with you know more anecdotes and links to some of the papers and the research on this. And um, probably a, a good place to start with that would be um, let me just. I'll give you the one because it kind of it links to all of the other related ones and i'll put that link directly in the chat um here it is yeah so you can you could start there and then click your way through to some of the other related deliberate practice articles i've written about it um Awesome. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I have another question. I mean, I know uh, the pandemic actually really interrupt a lot of musicians plan or even the, the a lot of orchestra actually postpone the, yeah. uh, their audition. So I mean, you know, I, I probably will assume a few orchestra may kind of brave enough to start soon. So in for this point, if I want to uh, get back in, um, what kind of things that you would suggest? I mean, we already have a few uh, experience, you know, like, for example, like a Dang Wang, those kind of things that practice to the point, you know, sick of that. And then we might put it on the side for a while. Now, yeah. how can yeah. I kind of get back on? Well, so, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to actually put another link in the chat here because it's, it's a blog post I wrote at the end of December. And I was um, really fortunate that I got an invitation from my friend Ed Choi, who plays principal percussion in the Seoul Philharmonic. And they invited me there for three months to play between November and uh, early February. And you know, the, it, this, this was at the point where the, the Met had been, you know, we were indefinitely furloughed. The Met wasn't paying us. We were all just kind of like hung out to dry. And uh, so I was really thrilled to have the opportunity. I was also frankly kind of terrified because I'd never gone this long without playing before, right? And, and I mean, just for clarification sake, right? Um, I, I am envious of the instrumentalists out in the world that can have their instruments with them, right? But my timpani are literally trapped at the Met. I cannot get in. I can't get in to get them. I can't practice. The best I have is like some pillows and foam pads where I can like do that. Um, but I just, I'd never been in this position before. And so the, the post I wrote was essentially about how I tried to reimmerse and kind of ramp back up to do this performance. And I mean, the, 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 basically the punchline of the blog post is that it did not go the way I expected. I expected that I was going to be sort of technically fumbling for weeks, you know, try, trying to get my chops back, trying to do all this. And that actually surprisingly came back pretty quickly, right? I like in, in, a, in a couple of weeks, I felt like I was back and, and able to do it and getting around the drums. And what was much more um, surprising to me and, and 
is going to take, I, I just think more, more time in this sort of like re-immersion process is the ensemble interactions part of it and the sort of mental state of performing. And you know what I mean by that is that there's so much in ensemble performance that is just, you know, I think there are very close ties to like the way we get used to being social creatures, you know, and we, we show up and with other human beings, we read body language and we, we get these little cues and, and everything in ways that Zoom makes literally two dimensional, right? And so, so for, for all of us in the world that have just been like desperately craving social interaction for the last 13 months, like that's part of what's getting starved. And I had not fully accounted for how that was going to play out in a musical context and how weird and awkward, like, like I sort of felt the musical equivalent of being like a 12 year old at somebody's birthday party that I didn't know. And, and like my voice is cracking. I'm like, oh, you're know, like, what am I doing? And I'm like, like very, very like hyper self-aware. And, and that also was part of this experience of like, you know, uh, go back to January of 2020 when we were doing the operas at the Met. Like I just took for granted this ability I had to go in, play for three or four or five hours and just be super cool about it. Like I was just really used to, you know, I was like, yeah, performance anxiety, what's that? I, I do this all the time. Oh, playing these big exposed timpani solos for thousands of people. Yeah, I mean, that's just my job. I just do that. And that part of it got busted. That like when, when the cameras turned on and I was like there on stage and solo, I was like, whoa, what's happening? And I had to like work so much harder than I was used to, to just keep my head in the game on you know the 65 minute symphony whereas like a year and a half before that i was doing six hours of good or damn i'm like fine no problem i can do that um but and, and and the thing is like i mean i think you're asking like how do how do you ramp up for that yeah there's the like technical stuff um and i i, just, I don't know how you prepare for that like th this this is a new thing that i think a lot of us are going to be experiencing now as things start to like turn back on and there's just no precedent in our field for having everything go on ice for like 18 months and then how you mentally readapt to that um so you know i'm i'm, I'm still kind of in the process of trying to figure that out i think what i can say is that knowing to expect some of that going in might be helpful or also knowing that virtually everybody else is going to be feeling the same way again just like it one of these you know things where you're around a bunch of teenagers and like yeah there's people that are pretending they're cool but actually everyone's super insecure and like i don't you know kind of uncomfortable in their own skin um i, I think that's going to be a pretty broadly shared experience great thank you yeah and um really qu another quick question is i know a lot of orchestra also will start to um accept uh, uh, recording uh, auditions. Um, so do we really um, go to like a professional studio, get the, as best as, as possible for the submit? Or, you know, I mean, during the past, I kind of used the, the, the Zoom machine. You just, uh, so yeah. what, what your take on that? That's a tough question to answer. I, I think, let me try to frame it this way. Um, the audition, I, I, I often think about this the way like Winston Churchill talked about democracy, which is like, it's the worst possible system except for all the alternatives, <laughs> right? So I think I think that like an audition system that, you know, has blind auditions and then also is often now more regularly having these like pre-screened recordings, it's the worst system except for everything else out there. And it's it's, there are going to be inevitable problems with it. What I can tell you is that in some of the more ideal situations, and I, I would count the way we do it at the Met as one of the more um, functional situations. You know, I listened, in between 2016 and 17, I listened to probably 250 different CD round submissions for our percussion and Tiffany audition. I can never remember hearing a recording and being like, wow, 
the, the, the recording quality is so exceptional that I want to advance them or the recording quality is so bad that I'm going to cut them. It's like after a few, I just like filtered that out entirely and I was just zeroing in on the playing. And the reality is, and I mean, I think this is especially obvious in, in timpani and, and percussion too, but, but I really think it holds across all the instruments. Um, you know, I, I, in, in my video, I, I briefly had that little um, graphic of the pyramid structure. And I'm gonna just show that again for a minute because I think one of the things I, realized in my own practicing that I, and I think really applies to these situations of making these recordings is that we listen and we perceive musical elements in a sort of unconscious hierarchy. And, and that there's legs to this, like a physical structure where if any one of these legs is weak or broken, the whole thing falls over, right? And, and everything else going on above that kind of doesn't matter. And you know, for me, it's it's time, rhythm, and intonation, just the, the fundamentals, right? And then above this, I have issues like clarity, evenness, consistency, and then we get to phrasing, and then we get to tone, and then we get to style and energy and interpretation, and all these other things. But what really is just sort of statistically true is that most people are getting their recordings cut or they're getting cut in prelims because of obvious deficiencies in this area. Whereas after that, the people who demonstrate that, that structure, that, that actual ability to support the other stuff, then give the listeners on the committee kind of the mental bandwidth to be able to pay attention to the artistic elements like phrasing and tone and, and all of the stuff. Because, you know, I think we also all kind of realize that like, yeah, you might have a really, you know, beautifully phrased passage, but if you're heinously out of tune, like, yeah, you're going to get caught. Like, that's not going to matter. And so the question is really like, is it worth $10,000 of studio time to go in when it's like this stuff that's really going to matter the most? In my case, I made my recording for the Met. I made my CD using my Zoom recorder. I just, I got in a space that, that let the timpani sound pretty good. The Zoom recorder gives high quality. Yeah, it's not studio quality, but it's close enough. But what it let me do was spend the kind of time I needed to, to make sure the actual playing was going to be as best as possible. And I mean, I think, you know, I, I wouldn't want people to misunderstand what I'm saying to be like, yeah, the quality of the recording doesn't matter. Like it, it can matter. But if you have to choose between like investing the time in making the playing really good and then living with a you know, pretty good quality recording, versus only giving yourself like five hours under pressure where you're paying for that studio time and you're super nervous about it. I just think more often than not, that's gonna give you something, an end result that you're like not as happy with. Thank you very much. That's a very hopeful and uh, kind of encouraging. Thank cool. you. Yeah, you got it. Hello, I have a bit of an embarrassing question. How would you give, could you give some advice to amateur players like me who are uh, like near the bottom of the pyramid? <laughs> you know, adapting uh, your, the principles you were, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you expounded to us very nicely. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Uh, thanks, Seth. So, so you're basically asking like, right, if, if you're not spending, you know, five hours a day doing this and, and all this kind of thing, right? I, I think my answer to you would be that there's nothing, you know, I, I tried to make it very literal on my spreadsheet where like you work with the time you have, but that the time you invest can still be really directed and targeted and, and high quality. And so if, you know, if it's something where, yeah, it, it is not the, the all consuming passion of your life or it's not your career, you're not dumping, you know, hours and hours and hours a week, you can still benefit tremendously from something as simple as, all right, I'm going to get one of these $350 Zoom recorders and I'm going to, I have a piece I'm working on and I'm going to work on it for a while and I'm going to try to sit and, you know, write down in my practice journal, like, what are my actual goals for this? How am I going to practice it? 
What are some of the strategies involved with that? And then how am I going to assess whether it's getting better? And that's going to be my own self-assessment and then playing it for somebody else who is who's my teacher. And at the end of that, I'm going, to, I'm going to do some of that work and I'm going to record it. And I'm going to take that recording and I'm going to keep it somewhere that I can reference. I mean, that, it's, it's a scalable workflow, right? That I think can adapt to however much time you want to dedicate to it. But the key is still to make sure that you're, you're giving yourself as much feedback as possible and you're keeping track of what that is and you know, having a way to kind of preserve some of these, lear- these lessons and, and this learning. And then you know, being aware that like this, this process of creating and then refining these mental representations never ends. And, and if there's, there's, no, there's no clear like binary demarcation between amateur and pro. It's just this continuum of like how, how long we've been at it and adding more detail and getting pickier and pickier. And I think, I, I mean, I, I've been surprised because I, I get other questions similar to yours, which is like, how, how young can we start incorporating this with students? And the honest answer is, I don't know. But I've been increasingly like, well, let me try this with a high schooler. Let me try this with a ninth grader. Currently, I'm working with a sixth grader on drum set. And, you know, this, this kid's really taking this stuff, doing self-recording and taking these notes. And, and, I'm, and I'm watching him get much better than I sort of initially thought he was going to be doing based on the work he was putting and so, I mean, I'm kind of at the point where I'm like, maybe it's never too young. I mean, certainly, you know, if, if it's at the point of like three-year-olds doing Suzuki stuff where they've got the shoebox just trying to figure out how to hold the violin, right, you got you to start with that stuff. But um, I mean, I think pretty early on emphasizing ideas of feedback and, and self-teaching and, you know, I, I guess one of the other ways I think about this is that when we, when we first start something, in, in any craft or any discipline, we're kind of fully dependent on a teacher to tell us what to do because we're starting from virtually ground level. And then, you know, I got to the point where I was like weeks before the Met audition and, and the tables had shifted. I was mostly working independently and then occasionally checking in with teachers and mentors and people getting feedback, but it was you know, largely self-directed. And so through the course of any sort of craft refinement like that, there's going to be this inevitable you know, crossing of, of trajectories where you're assuming more and more responsibility and sort of agency for your work. And I, I think even fairly young kids are amazingly receptive to that idea of kind of being able to have ownership of what they're doing and that that can stoke more of that interest and, and honestly creativity. Um, you know, when, when they can come up with a way to do something and not just have to rely on a teacher being like, dun, 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 all this stuff. Um, so, and, and I think my opinion as of now is that, yeah, there's, there's not like necessarily a strict age cutoff to that, just like there's not a strict division between amateur and pro. Okay, thank you, thank you. Nice. You got it. I just think about how uh, how how much better we could all be if we started doing this younger. You know, I, I love your I love your analogy of uh, bowling through a through a curtain, because um, I got a lot better, but it was the kind of sheer force of will. <laughs> right, right, um, and 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 that's honestly how it's been for a lot of people for a long time. But and and that was part of I mean my my motivation to start getting some of this material together was just like, yeah, what, what would I tell myself if I could go back in time and like just save myself a lot of kind of inefficient effort and, and time. Yeah. I might even like music a little bit better at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Does anybody else have any, any questions for Jason? Well, super, um, Jason, you've been so generous with your time and your ideas, and I know that we're all inspired. Um, I just put a couple links in the chat uh, that we had talked about earlier. Um, and uh, that's, I will be following up with an email to everybody who registered, sending along the other links that Jason mentioned in the chat. If you do wanna save the chat, you can go down to the lower right-hand corner of the chat. There's three dots 
if you click on that, you can be um, you can save it. Um, I also um, wanted to reiterate that um, we are doing a couple more sessions that are coming up next week. Uh, we're doing a master class with Kelly Hall Tompkins. Uh, and the week after, we're doing another financial workshop, and this should be really interesting with Elaine Grogan Luttrell of Minerva Financial Arts, and that's on uh, arts funding in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, something we might possibly be interested in. Um, so do tune in for those, and we're going to be announcing our season in June um, with a lot of events that are available to all of you. Uh, we are committed to providing all of this for you for free, but also to paying our artists. So um, I put a link in the chat to our PayPal. It's a tax deductible contribution that you can make. Um, but I just wanted to circle back to, to Jason and, and say, um, I just think it's so valuable uh, as we navigate all of what life has been giving us in the pandemic to really remember why we're all doing it, which is, is the art. And also that pursuit of perfection um, that will never get there, but but just in a the, the way that you've laid it out um, in a very uh, methodical way that kind of takes some of the needless self-flagellation out of it, <laughs> um, and puts a little structure in there and 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 self accountability, but also kind of a great way to to check in with the progress that we are making. So. Um, I think it's really valuable as we start to see more people doing live performances, let's be really great at what we do when we get back to it. Um, so thanks again, Jason. Thanks to everybody who uh, tuned in for this. Like I mentioned, I will follow up uh, with an email with some of the links that we talked about and also with Jason's slides and hope to see you in the next couple of weeks and in June um, for lots of, uh, other great artists and workshops and master classes. So thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Jason. This has been really yes, fantastic. Thank you all. It's been thanks. great.